Today, I spoke with Abigail. Abby's life went from bad to worse in both situations. And then an even third level of really bad happened. How do you survive when things go from neglect to being in the system to being adopted by a relative to becoming a sex slave and then it can get worse? You'll hear Abby's story today and you will also hear how she came out of it into the woman of hope with a family and who she is today. I can't wait for you to hear this story. Here's Abigail. Joining me today is Abby Alvarado. As I have gone through her horrific story of, of abuse and the many feelings of shame, guilt, and despair that she has had throughout her life, I just want to welcome her with open arms and an open heart and tell her how wonderful it is to be able to communicate with a fellow survivor and how much I admire her courage for being here to share her story. Welcome, Abby. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled. Now, I know that your story has many twists and turns. One of the main things that stands out to me is that as a young girl being raised with your older sister and a little brother in your home where there was always a constant party going on, as you have basically said, you had no idea when your mom was asking you to get up on the coffee table and dance for everybody that was there that you were actually being raised in a crack house. And I think when people realize that your story goes from bad to worse, I think our hearts are going to be broken for you. But we also see in front of us, if we're watching on YouTube, we see a beautiful, beautiful young woman who has overcome so much. So first of all, let's go back to the moment when it went from bad to worse. And we're going to go back in time before that. But I want you to tell us when it went from bad to worse. When it went from bad to worse, I was nine years old. Um, and it just progressed till I was 24 years old. And um, I had... Um, some people, I'll just say people for now, some people to help me um, keep my head together and um, survive what I went through. So you were able to survive and you did basically escape from what became a, a, an entire, you know, age 9 to 24 lifetime of, of real serious trafficking and abuse. So let's go back. Now that we know you're going to survive, can you tell us what, it, what your earliest memories of your childhood were like and how, and how it was in that first home that you grew up in with your single mom? I just remember um, having different people in the house through days and nights and loud music and um, beer bottles everywhere. And um, I had my siblings to be there with me and we, we were just there and in the room. Um, I remember times that my mom would um, dress me up in pretty clothes and put makeup on me and then she'll tell me to go and get on a coffee table and dance for these people that were there that I didn't know. It was just, it was a hard, hard times for me. Remember one time cutting my toe, 
um, open where I almost came off totally. There's just, there's so many things that I remember, but those were like the two main story Dan- dancing on the coffee table cutting your toe wide open and no one there to really be able to care for you and you're right your sister who was what a couple years older and then a younger brother by about a, a year younger than you if I recall is that right that's right so did you all take you three as little kids were you taking care of each other where did the food come from where did the safety at all come from were you always a part of that same room where all of the where all of the drugs and the alcohol and the party basically was happening? Or were you no, able to go but, to a same spot? Yeah, we were able to go to a different room, like our bedroom. That was our safe spot. Um, we would find whatever was in the house, in the kitchen. My sister was a little old enough to know what to make and what not to make, or what to touch and not to touch. She she was like the mom of the house. Wow. And these are memories from early childhood, like six, seven, eight years old. Yes. Well, about right now. So your your little older sister was being the the mom and uh trying to make sure that everybody got something something to eat that day and do you remember any other abuses in your home at that time other than obviously neglect and dancing on the coffee table? All of those things I would consider all of that abuse, but like any sexual um, or physical abuse at that point, or was it just you were getting set up for what was to come? I don't remember none of that. I just remember the the dancing, um, anything else, I I don't remember. So it's just that many years ago that it's hard to remember anything else. But that's enough because then tell us what happened in May of 1988. Um, I was sent to Hawaii with my uncle. Um, me, my sister, and my brother went and because we got taken away from my mom because of the neglect and uh, we were in a shelter. Who took you away? Who took you uh, away? Child Protective Services took us away and they took us to a shelter here in Texas and um, we were there for a while and They were trying to get people to adopt us, but they didn't want three kids. And we were older and they didn't want that either. So my, I don't know how my sister found out about my uncle being in the army. So he, he was able to um, take us in and adopt us eventually. And we, we got on a plane with the social worker and went to Hawaii Okay, so that's where your uncle was living, and at, yes, at yes, at the time he was living in Hawaii because he was in the army. Okay, and was he married? Tell us a he, little bit about his family situation. He was married with my aunt Laura, and they had a son, but it was from my aunt Laura's previous. Um, boyfriend or marriage okay Um, but that was it that they just had them three and then they took in me my sister and my brother okay so I don't know if you can remember the sensations or the thoughts or feelings you were having at that time were were you relieved to be out of your mom's home or were you scared I can't imagine that it was clear what was going on? You were so young. I was all over the place. I was sad. I was happy, um, scared. I was really sad because I didn't want to leave my mom. Like, even though she 
didn't take care of us properly. I love my mom and I didn't want to leave her. I was scared for her because I didn't know what was going to happen to her. And at the same time, I was happy because I was going. uh, Eventually, I ended up getting happy because we knew where we were going to go and we were with family. We were going to come to this beautiful island that we never knew that existed. So, yeah, I just, I was everywhere at the time. Which, of course, is absolutely what what you would expect because oftentimes children, even in the worst of circumstances, they still cry out for their mom, even when it's the mom that's causing the abuse or the neglect. You have that instinctual connection to that person. And so right before you were getting on that plane with the social worker to fly to Hawaii, you talked about that last night in the shelter, something about, I don't know, a dream or a memory or something. Could you describe what happened that night before you got on the plane to go to Hawaii where you were wondering, you know, what is my life going to be like there? Will I get my own bedroom? Will it be like a great big, you know, backyard or a beach or all those things that you might have been thinking? What happened in that moment when you were about to leave the shelter? I had a memory of me when I was little. Um, My mom took us on vacation to El Paso. And I remembered we were in the pool at nighttime and my uncle was there. My aunt was there and my two siblings and my mom. I remember my sister and brother were tired of swimming. So my mom took them up to the hotel room and my uncle, um, was watching me and he told me that I was going to be his wife someday. And as a little kid, I was so confused, didn't know. It didn't phase me because I was a kid. I didn't know what he was talking about. And like, but at the same time, I was like, why would I be his wife? I'm a little kid. And he's a... Right. You were five or six years old, you said, about that age, when when this memory of being in the pool with him. What would it mean? You know, so very confusing and so unsettling. Even even a little kid can kind of know that something is wrong with that statement. But you don't know what. You certainly don't have the words to tell somebody or or question anything, especially with the unpredictable life that you lead in in the home that you are being raised in. There's not a lot of security or safety, but, you know, what do you do? Right. You're going to go. This is the person who said, we'll take these three children in and you're going to go on your way. So what happens when you land in Hawaii? What what was the first thing that... It was was beautiful. We got out of off of the plane. We saw the beach and the the palm trees. Um, we ended up getting in a black SUV and driving to an ap- apartment complex where, like, uh, on a military base. And we get there, and there's like this warm welcome from um, my aunt and my uncle, and I get, I guess, my cousin at the time. Um, and a cake and a welcome sign. It was really nice, welcoming, like welcome home kind of party. And so your uncle was actually a sergeant, right, in the U.S. Army, and yes. your aunt was a child care worker. That's what you had. Uh, and you talk about this all in your book that we will be sure and and uh, mention both of your books 
as we continue on. But so you, you get to this beautiful place. You feel totally welcomed with open arms and lots of love. And that lasts for about, what, three months? You said? Yes. Yes, it did. Only three months of happiness and warmth. And then tell me what happened next. Three months after getting there, um, I was home alone with my, my uncle. Well, after the adoption, he was dad. But so the I, adoption happened quite quickly. The, the whole paperwork and you being adopted happened within those three months. Yes, it did. Okay. For all of your, you and your sister and brother. Yes. Uh, it, it happened fast. So after those three months, he became um, dad. But in my case, I like, I would call him stepdad. So I don't. Yeah. Um, he, we were home alone watching TV and um, he started rubbing my feet. And as a kid, I'm like, oh, okay, you know, this is fine. And then he started gradually going up my legs and rubbing, started rubbing my calves and my thighs. So I started freaking out and didn't know what was going on. Um, then we heard the door open and my siblings and my stepmom came in the room and um, in the house because they went shopping or I don't remember what where they went. And I just remembered like if nothing happened and he did say, you know, don't tell, don't tell mom about this. This is going to be our secret. And I was like, okay, you know, you were just rubbing my legs. And I thought it was weird that he would say that. And it happened a couple of more times and, and the same thing. Don't tell mom. It's our little secret. And eventually I just, ended up telling my stepmom about it and she told me um don't talk like that don't tell anybody else I don't believe you he's not that kind of man and I was like okay I guess I'm not gonna tell nobody I'm gonna keep it to myself and you know went to my room and started crying because my mom didn't believe me was that right after you had uh, said that as it escalated, the frequency, you know, increased like it would happen. But was it was it in the beginning just the touching, the bad touching and, you know, touching on your on your panties and, and, and that? Or did it pretty quickly escalate into a little more, um, you know, to that more brutal kinds of violence that I know you speak about but at this point you're nine when did when did it escalate to more when I was um it happened later on like 12 13 years old when it started gradually like happened more and okay. worse and so when it was happening more, was there a point where the, the threats, you know, for you not to tell became more violent, more manipulative in some ways? Yes, they, they did. Um, um, I just remembered getting told not to tell nobody um it would get worse if I did he's he said it would get worse for you if you were to tell anybody and I was so scared I didn't know I didn't know um what to do because my mom didn't believe me the first time I told her so I just 
didn't have no one to talk to when it started getting worse. Right. So in in that in that period of time, you're now getting into your, you know, you're in your tween, you know, times of, you know, going from 11, 12, 13, nobody to talk to. It's been the 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 molestation has been happening since you were 9 and no one to talk with. Are you are you going to school? Are you what are some of the other things that are going on in your life and around your life at this time? I was going to school like a regular kid. I was a I on the outside of the house, I was a regular kid but wasn't able to do regular kid stuff like going to football games, um being in cheerleading, volleyball. I wasn't able to do none of that. Um but I was a I was a normal kid, half half normal kid outside of the house. But when I was inside the house, I was scared because I didn't know when my stepdad will come into my room and, you know, do do his his stuff that he would do to me. I'm so sorry. All of those many, many complicated, you know. You you often see how, you know, we act one way out in public and nobody would suspect anything is wrong and then everything is wrong, you know, at at home. And so the fact that he's using, you know, mind games, manipulation, coercion, you know, physical threats, emotional manipulation, all of these things that people can't see is what actually I think leads to the the huge feelings of shame and guilt and and um, being unworthy and our self-esteem is completely obliterated. You didn't have much of a chance for any kind of building your own self um, up because you were you were suffering from neglect and and that's a very isolating feeling as well. And now you're in this new place and now it's become this very, very scary place where you are, you are being literally um, used for sex, for serving this this uncle, dad who's adopted you, his needs. What is the rest of the family doing during this time? Um, is 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 his wife aware now after all these years and just? still in the we don't talk about things like that but she knows it's happening at the time i don't know because she she never told me like if she knew anything about it um it it was it's it was hard to explain how she was because it was normal we were normal when everybody was around when my siblings were around he would act normal like if nothing was going on um it's hard to explain sometimes uh yeah it it's because it's weird like he he had his own code on like do this and like I knew what he was talking about it and that's part of like the the brainwashing manipulation he he would it was it's just so hard to explain on how everything was yes and I think that that's often what what we're left with when somebody tells their story is I don't even have the words to say how it was because it's so hard to explain because there's, um, I often call it like this layered, they're layering threats and then they're laying in there some emotional, um, it's like, it's like warfare. You don't know where the next grenade is going to explode. You don't yeah. know every step you take. It really is truly like walking on you know, eggshells, but with a bigger consequence. It's like walking on 
grenades or through a, a field where you don't know where the next landmine is going to go off. And that's what keeps you in that frightened and complicit, you know, it's never, it's never your fault, but because you don't know what to do when you're that age, you don't know how to tell, you don't have anyone to tell because they were, they were even not allowing you to do the normal everyday things that you would have done. You would have liked to have done cheerleading. You would have liked to have done some of those other activities, but they, they didn't let you do that. They were right. isolated you, right? Yes. They um, did. Okay. Um, so were they in Hawaii for this whole entire time or did they come back to Texas? Because I think at one point you said that you came back into the Texas state of Texas and then you were moving around a lot. Can you tell us yeah. about that time period? Two years after being adopted and going to Hawaii, we ended up leaving Hawaii and moving to Tex back to Texas. And we were in Houston for some time, and then we ended up just moving and moving afterwards. Um, the moving was because uh, reports were getting um, caught on uh, on them from CPS. Okay. So do you know who was reporting? Do you think it was your your older sister or someone else? Were people actually seeing signs and they were reporting or was it family members? I I know for a fact, I believe my sister reported it once and that was after we had moved and she stayed behind with her boyfriend. And um but other than that, I uh, one more time was my best friend. I told my best friend one time what was going on in the house. And she told her mom because she knew that it wasn't right for a dad to be doing stuff like that. So she told her mom and her mom ended up calling uh, Child Protective Services and... um. So my parents found out and we ended up moving from Houston to another city. Okay. So just pick up and move rather than, you know, be caught. And when you were 16, there was a, a really big turn of events that I think is a really interesting. Could you tell people about what happened at age 16 when you were 16? At age 16, um... My parents had called me into the into their room and sat me down to have a conversation. And I remember them. I remember my stepmom telling me that I was going to have their kids because she wasn't able to have any more kids. And I told them that I wasn't going to do that. I'm I'm a kid myself. Like, I'm not doing it. And they told me I'm going to do it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So at this time is when I realized that she probably knew the whole time and she just was so in love with this man or in her own little world with him. Or he was manipulating her too. I don't know what was going through her head for her to now get involved at the age of 16. So now they're literally in their bedroom with you saying, you, Abby, are going to be or serve us as a surrogate for children that we are unable to conceive. And you respond with, I'm not doing that. What happened? I went to my room and cried, and my stepmom ended up tracking my periods and eventually had my first child. You that had their I, child. Their child, yes. And on your 
adoptive or your stepdad, as you call him, fathered by him, who is a blood relation to you. Yes. I was told not to tell anybody who the father was. I would, um, to tell people that it was a guy from the neighborhood or a random person that I met at the movies. Then I don't even go to the movies. I wasn't allowed to do nothing. So I had to tell people lies and just lying about it constantly. So you had the first child at age 16? 16, 17, yes. Okay. And then were there other children that followed? Um, see, 18. Three, two or three years later, I had um, another child. Um, I ended up having her in 2008. I was walking the stage with the big old, I was pregnant walking the stage, but I was proud of myself because I was able to graduate and finish school, and get my diploma. Um, and then years, two, three years later, I have a third child by by him. So you, you pregnant, walk across the stage to get your diploma. First of all, congratulations on being you. that woman, that person who could survive all of these things and get your diploma and graduate from high school. It's unbelievable that you were able to do that. And I'm so proud of you. And I can't tell you how my heart goes out to you to have three children that were fathered by this man for them to have children, your stepmom, your stepdad, your stepdad is the father of the children, but they think that they are your siblings, correct? Yes. For for years, um, my kids thought I was their big sisters. They called me Abby growing up. And um, Mother's Day was the hardest for me because... <clears throat> I didn't receive no gifts from them. They gave their gifts to my stepmom. Um, hearing her, hearing my kids call her mom was hard too. I can't even imagine, Abby, what, what that kind of torture and torment must have felt like to know the truth and yet to be too scared. And to be basically in the servitude of these two depraved human beings. Did, was there ever any other time where that escalated even farther? Because you talked about depraved threesomes that would sometimes take place. I don't know if you feel comfortable, you know, just telling us a little bit about that. You don't have to go into detail. That just sounds terrible. Oh, I just, the only thing I could say is that uh, we had threesomes and it was a lot of times and it was just so disgusting and messed up, but they brainwashed me so much. I wasn't able to talk about it or you know, have anybody help me. Exactly. And I think so often people who are, are hearing this as we are actually in domestic violence awareness, um, that's this month, I think people should realize that this to me is not only child abuse, child rape, child neglect, and then there's also the fact that you are being exploited domestically in a relationship, not of your choosing, that you're still being raped by your 
by your stepfather and father and he's fathering children for he and his wife to raise as their own and you're unable to tell anyone because you're so scared you are so brainwashed and when people say things like why didn't you know this person just you know leave or run away or why didn't they tell somebody you know as if somehow you ever would have had a chance to be able to know what to do and how to do any of that is so ridiculous that i often say the reason people are scared to tell their stories is because nobody understands what sociopathic manipulation brainwashing and what emotional as well as physical and sexual abuse is they don't they don't understand people don't have a way out where would you have gone you didn't have a way out i was a kid where to go kid but exactly and that's what scared me the most was to tell my story because i knew people i know people are going to be out there judging but i was a kid I was a kid myself having kids. I didn't have no, I wasn't allowed to go to parties, um, meet friends. I didn't have no one. I was totally by myself. No, oh, it just, it's just heartbreaking. And I'm so sorry that this all happened to you. And I find it very interesting how, how she, you know, his wife, Definitely, if she didn't know, she she turned a very a very dark corner when she began to participate in the abuse. And obviously, I I don't have a lot of you know sympathy for her unless somewhere along the line she was also you know manipulated or 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 groomed or assaulted. She might have been scared, but it sounds to me like that all just became about keeping you, you know, in that state of constant fear. It was about you and that the way they treated your sister was completely the opposite. Yes. It was. Tell us about that. She was able to be on the dance team, go out to movies, um, have a boyfriend. Everything that I want to do, she was able to do and I wasn't. And I knew it wasn't fair, but I couldn't do nothing about it. I I would say something and then it would just turn into a big argument and be sent to my room. So I was just like, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm just going to quit and, you know, just stay in my room and stay quiet. But in in my head, I knew I had to do something. Yeah. Well, so she was kind of, you know, I, I've heard this story in this way, in this one part that we're talking about right now before, that it almost feels as if they choose one person to be, one child to be like, you know, the golden child. And then the other child is, that's the one that we're going to abuse. And that's the one that's going to have to do these things. And then this one over here is for the emotional support of something, you know, like they're like they almost have a whole list of this is what this child will be to us. And this is what this child will be to us. And this is what this it's almost like like some kind of psychopathy that I can't quite put my almost like like each of them have a different personality and a different purpose. But none of them are actually seen or heard or loved for who they are but I've heard that story quite a bit in recent years and I'm like what is that that makes people be able to box you know their children into different categories for use you know because even your older sister you had mentioned they would they kind of set her up as uh, a way to make money from her being the you know the golden child the miracle girl Tell us a little bit about that. I thought that was such an interesting part of your story. Um, 
I just remember that she, that my mom's, my stepmom said that um, my oldest was um, able to talk to saints and um, heal people with, with cancer or depression. So they would put this on social media, uh, Facebook, um, and they would tell people that she's a healer. So they would come and they would lay hands. She would lay hands, like pray on them like this. And um, where would they do that? Where at their home? At the in the backyard. So we had okay out a rental house. And it all started there first. She was about um, eight or nine when it all st- it started very early. But when they started getting like more people coming, like fifty people to a hundred people coming uh, every weekend to the house, um, she was around eight or nine, maybe younger. Um, and then, but no, you were younger than her and you didn't go to, is this in Hawaii or is this? No, this, this was my, um, what you're talking about is my oldest daughter. Oh, your oldest daughter. It wasn't your sister. It was your oldest daughter. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. Sorry. I got the, the people mixed up. Okay. So this is the, your, the first child that you had for them. Now they're using her as this healer to yeah. what make money, and then you have something. So something is set up in the backyard when she's around seven. You're saying, like, yeah, a, like a chapel like, or a sanctuary like, of sorts. Well, it was like a just a typical backyard, and then we ended up moving again, and uh, the the house that we moved in had another house in the backyard, so we converted that to an to a chapel. So that's how it all started. It get it got really big. The news came out. Um, bishops were coming, and they flew us to um, California, and we, she did some healing down there. And it was all to make money because they would pass around and give people would give donations and. It was just to make money and it was just, it was weird because I don't know how it all started. My daughter doesn't remember. I asked my daughter now if she like sees saints or can hear, you know, voices. And she's like, mom, no, that's crazy. Like, I'm not crazy. I was like, okay, it was just a question. I was just asking just to see if it was true or not. And I believe it wasn't true. Wow, that is so, so, so insightful as to the level of um, manipulation that yes. those step parents went to using you as a surrogate, using mm-hmm. you as a, a sexual, you know, for his own sexual whatever needs were. And for using your firstborn child that they have claimed as their own, that's what you did, two girls and a boy. And now to to do this, you know, create this scene of this this little girl who who is healing people from these various things. And now people are paying for that and she's being flown around. I it just it just blows my mind. So you're there just doing all of the taking care of their needs, the housekeeping and the, you know, the physical sexual needs. A lot of you staying there, in my opinion, is because you were afraid for these children that you've now birthed that are their children. They're not, but that's what they're saying. Yeah. And you don't want, you know, you don't, you're, you're worried about their safety. You're worried about all of that. And then who's going to believe you? I mean, this is what survivors are are left with when they've been through something from their earliest memories you know through that neglect through the foster not even foster care you didn't get that far but through being adopted but through child protective services then being shuffled into 
this other home, which ended up being, you know, worse and in every way. Um, so tell me how you came, how you started to come out of this. And you said it lasted until age 24, basically, this total hell, which is one of the, ti- that's in the title of one of your other books. Um, just tell me, how did it begin to unravel and get you out of this situation and onto um, your own healing and changing your your life from that point on? It took forever. Um, uh, first, I'm going to say I was threatened with my life. Um, he tried to kill himself and God didn't, was like, nope, it's not your time. Um, he threatened me. He threatened my kids. And th- those were other reasons why I did not get out. I want to say that because I was scared for my life. And he said that he was going to kill us, slice our throats. Um, then eventually... People started coming to the chapel, like I was saying. Um, One day, we were having services, um, and a man comes up, and he's um, dressed in all white from the shirt down to his shoes, fresh cut. And he, to me, he looked like an angel. Um, something told me in my head, hey, that man that you're looking at, he is going to be the one to help you. He's going to be the one to help you survive. He's going to help you get out. I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I don't believe it. Um, and just that voice in my head was like, nope, believe it. Believe it. You have to believe it. I'm like, okay, I'll believe it. Um. He said hi. I said hi. He introduced myself. He introduced himself. Um, ended up getting on social media, looking him up. We found each other, started talking. Had to, um, I had to delete conversations that we would have um, because I wasn't able to talk to anybody. And my parents would go through my phone. So conversations, phone calls, I had to be like really secretive about that. Right. Yeah. It took, yes, control. And it took some time. He eventually bought me a separate phone. And I was like, why would you do that? No. I can't accept it. He's like, no, it's for your safety. He didn't know anything that was going on. He just knew I was scared. Um, Mm -hmm. We would stop talking with each other and then we would start again. And it was off and on like that for um, a year. And then he was like, okay, enough's enough. I'm a grown man. I can't do this no more. Um, The secrets and everything. So I eventually opened up to him and told him everything that was going on. And he believed me, which was huge, huge for me because I was so scared that he wasn't going to believe me. He was going to leave me and, you know, I wouldn't see him again. He was like, I believe you. I believe you a hundred percent if you need like, when you're ready, just call me and I will come and get you. And I go, well, I can't just leave me by myself. I'm, if I leave, I'm taking my kids because I had two daughters and a son. If he could do what he did to one daughter, he could do to another daughter. And I didn't want so eventually, Ooh, the mama tiger in you, did they know by this time? Did your children know that they were biologically your children? No, no. They, they knew after 
I had escaped. And it took about a few months for me to tell him, tell them that I was actually their mom. So I was so scared. I didn't know what was going to happen or what would they It's 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 an incredible story. So this man, um, what was his name? Rudy. I Rudy told me. Rudy stands by your side. You eventually do tell him everything. He believes you. That's number one. He believed yeah. you. What a relief! Yes, a what a gift. That is the gift, right? Is to believe that person, and. Look at all of these twists and turns that you went through. I mean, I know why we keep quiet because we don't think anybody will believe us. But when someone does, that makes all the difference. So then you 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 set your intention. You're going to leave with your children, and a few months later, you execute that plan with Rudy's help. And where do you go from there? I go with him to his house. Um, we, he told me that if I wasn't in love with him, that I could leave um, and be my own person. I'm free now. And for him to say I'm free now was like, is this a dream? Like, am I really out? Um, but I was, a, I was in love with him. I wasn't going nowhere. We were madly in love like it was meant to be for us to be together and we've been together for nine years and married wow and you have your children i have my children here with me and we had a child together oh oh my word what a what a wonderful way to end this story and the most important thing is that you have now written a book about all of this, and I think um, we want everybody to know the title of that because what's included in the book are all of these documents and court records and the CPA, um, you know, all of the things that they were suspected of, you know, these two people were repeatedly suspected of child abuse and how those allegations against them were just dismissed again and again. And we hear that story over and over as well. How do we get people to believe and how do you get a child to talk who is so scared that things are only going to get worse, which is what happened to you? And yet, ultimately, tell us how that story ends for them. We know yours has a, a happy ending, even though it's a journey. We understand we're not saying everything is perfect, but look at that. You've been married for nine years. You have your three children. You're a miracle. You really are, Ab. Thank you. You're a miracle. So Thank what you. happened to them? Because I, I love to hear this, and, you, and we want to read about this in your book, <laughs> which has a very long title. I thought it was two books for a long time, <laughs> but I no. think it's actually one book. Is that right? Yes. One Just, book. Okay. Um, they ended up getting caught and being put in prison, um, life sentencings, I can't think the top of my head right now, but it is in the book, um, like sentencing. Um, a funny thing, funny thing is, is I hate it, but it's funny. I hate that he didn't last long to suffer, like, he made me suffer, but my stepdad eventually um, passed away in prison on April Fool's Day. Oh, wow. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Wow. I, from my biological mom, and she told me that he had died in prison, and I didn't believe her because I was like, it's April Fool's Day. I'm not going to believe you. And she's like, no, it's true. So I had to call my sister. Uh, so the great thing is you did, you were able to re reconnect with your mother. Your, yeah. Your actual biological mother. Oh my goodness. That's, that sounds like a whole other story we need to tell. Yes. I outline. 
I was able to find my biological mother. Um, we did reconnect and we got out of connection and, and we're try I'm trying to get back into connection with her and reconnect with her. But it was, it was amazing to meet her. Um, to just be in her life again. I helped her out with certain stuff, um, her health and everything. Um, I've always wanted to know who my biological dad was. Um, ended up finding him because my mom knew who it was. Ended up finding him and spending... Ended up spending a year and a half with him until he passed away. Wow. Well, I just cannot say how... I don't even think the right word is impressive. It's more than that. It's about how you and your own spirit of being able to heal and being able to seek out, you know, people from your early childhood that maybe would have been thought of as, you know, monsters or, and you you reconnected and you were able to actually help them. I think that that speaks volumes about you and who you are as a person. And in your book, I Am Abigail, A Texas Woman's Childhood Nightmare and Her Escape from Hell as a Sex Slave Survivor, you are a survivor. You are definitely one of those stories where people will be able to say, if she did it, so can I. And for me to have you on this podcast and to have your whole story shared for anyone who, who might come across it is just really a gift to those listening. I want to thank you so much for, for that gift. I think uh, you should close out this conversation by the positive thing that you had said, how you just want people to find the courage that it took you a lot of courage to tell your story and to inspire people who feel stuck, especially people out there listening who might have, you know, not only child abuse or child rape, but that are also struggling with domestic violence because often those two things are connected almost always. Yes. And really your story is about that as well and how you escaped all of those things to become this happy person and to have a happy life. That's what you said, that there is hope. Yes. So it's a little bit more about your hope. What are your, what, how did that resurrect? How did that come back to you to have hope? Meeting meeting my husband was my hope um, and him believing me. Um, that brought everything out. Um, what helped me survive is when I said those people, I mean, my kids are my everything. Um, they helped me survive because I wanted to, you know, quit. And I didn't. I didn't want to because I knew that he might end up doing the same thing to my girls. So I just, you know, I thought I woke up every day thinking of my kids and, you know, getting out one day. And eventually I did when I met my husband and he brought hope out for, for me because um, he believed in me. He, he believed in me and he knew that I was going to be a strong person and I am now I'm you no know, I don't let no one tell me anything anymore I'm this like I have a mouth now like I speak out and if I, I know you're telling me something that it's not true or you know I'll let you know but I ended up getting with um Jamie Collins and having her write my book because I wanted to inspire other women, men, kids, um, and 
you know, inspire them and let them know that somebody's out there and they're going to hear you. They're going to believe you. You just have to have an ounce of hope for for yourself and they'll heal it. They're, eventually, you're going to find your person and they're going to help you out in mysterious ways. You just got to you got to speak out and let oh thank you oh so good (laughs) that's so good Mm. what were you gonna say sorry i think i interrupted you and let what and And let speak out and and let somebody hear you and they'll they will and so just keep speaking out until until it happens yes until it happens Mm. Well, I love that because for me, I I honestly think that that the healing journey really does begin when you can tell your story and be believed. So thank you so much for sharing your incredible story of survival and your incredible story of hope through the very worst. Dear. And I I hope that your your four children and your husband know that their mother, their wife is a rock star. So thank you again for being on the podcast today. Thank you for sharing from the heart. You've been through so much and you have so much to offer. I hope people will get your book. Where can we find that? And where can we find you for those that want to get in touch or follow you or something? <laughs> I have a uh, online retails um amazon has it barnes and nobles has it um i have an instagram it uh abigail survivor i believe um okay so abigail survivor yes and then we can find the book on amazon or at barnes and noble Barn- yes brilliant That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing with me and for just being the stand that you are for people to use their voice and keep, keep, keep using it. Even if somebody doesn't believe you at first, you'll find the person that will, and that will make all the difference. Right. Thank you, Abby. Yeah.